Welcome to the Dome Dog Podcast. I'm your host, Matt DeBritz. And today my guest is co-founder and CMO of Three Wishes Serial, Ian Wishingrad. What's up, Ian? What's up? Thanks for having me. It said in your profile that you've been building brands since you were a teenager. What about the Syracuse brand made you want to go there? So I was really attracted to the Newhouse School where I went in the brand. I started making kind of movies and fake commercials when I was 14 and 15 in high school. So I was either going to go to USC film if I got in there. I got into NYU film and got into Newhouse. I did not get into USC. And as an only child, my parents were thrilled. And I thought it was kind of meant to be them. I went to Newhouse. They had this wall of fame. You saw these amazing, famous alums. And it felt like Newhouse felt like this perfect marriage of business and creativity, which is who I am at the core. So that really the alumni base and the school and the focus on the stuff I love is what drew me there. And the fact that it had like cool sports teams, it was a big college. It felt like you felt like you get the college experience and you get a great education. So while you were there, Syracuse kind of, I wouldn't say they had a down, a down cycle, but 2005, they had remnants of the national championship team, but they lost the first round to Vermont. 2006, they played pretty bad during the season, but then made a run in the Big East tournament that was awesome, but flamed out in the first round. 2007, they're in the NIT. 2008 season, 2007, 2008 season, there was some hope because of incoming freshmen. One was Johnny Flynn. The other one was Dante Green. Dante Green was kind of what people thought maybe could have been the next Carmelo Anthony. He really wasn't, but he scored 17 points a game. He had a lot of points as a freshman, second most all time. And there's whispers of him leaving after his freshman year. And I didn't want him to do that. A lot of people in Syracuse didn't want him to do it. You didn't want him to do it. What did you do to persuade him not to leave? Well, he left, so I didn't persuade him. I think I only accelerated his exit. (laughs) Uh, My buddy Scott and I were, I think, at like the Destiny Mall or whatever it was called at the time or what it was then. I don't know. We were watching uh, Cloverfield, I think, and we were talking before the movie started, and we came up with this idea for Don't Leave. I I said that name, and he laughed. So I made the T-shirts, and he kind of, I think he saw them, and I, he liked them. And I heard about it through Amanda Gold. Amanda Gold's dad is like a huge Syracuse fan, Neil Gold. He always sits courtside. And um, so I went to a practice or either she gave him a shirt or I gave him a shirt at like the bar. I found him, I gave him the shirts and then he wore the shirt during warmups. I think, unless I've told the story so many times where I'm like lying and making it up, but I know I watched him wear it during warmups and I rem- think it was against Georgetown and I think it was an ESPN yep. game day. Yep. Some of that is true. Some of that may be like how I retell history, but he definitely wore it during warmups and a New York Times reporter or someone that gave the photo to the New York Times shot him. And that shirt was like what became a meme. I mean, it said, don't they leave. Right. Then people would make don't they shoot, don't they this. And that is like what a meme was in 2007, 2008, before, you know, the internet really was like what it is today. And we were selling tons of shirts. And then I almost had like the t-shirt guy. So the mall wanted to get into like a mall store. So people really wanted it. And then a couple of weeks before graduation, we had made a ton of buzz. I got a cease and desist letter from the school, which scared the crap out of me because like I was very afraid I was going to graduate. I wanted to go into advertising. So I kind of technically already had my portfolio. Yeah. This was my like a, a great portfolio piece. And I had no interest interest in screwing with the school. So I just stopped and that was it. How much money did you make off the those t-shirts? A couple grand or something. I don't know. It was nothing that significant. A couple grand, but it put you on the map because ESPN was there. Syracuse.com, when I was looking you up, I saw the article was almost just like a full advertisement for you. It said, had your own Gmail with your, your name on it and your phone number posted right there. I don't know if that's still your phone number, but it's it's out there right on, on Syracuse.com if you Google it. Um, but I mean, three weeks from graduation at that point, as you said, he had already left. You're graduating. Why do you think they sent you a letter at that point? Oh, I mean, the school's job is to just, is to just make your life difficult. If you're remotely, they're the only ones that can profit off, quote, profit off amateur athletes. So because the number five was on the back, and it was close to Dante, that was considered, you know, we know who you're talking about, basically. So the school is very litigious. So do you still have that letter? Is it framed behind you there? Or is, or is that? No, uh, no, no. There have been more significant things since. I don't know. I'm sure I have it somewhere, but it's all good. Yeah. So a year and a half later, about you were back at the Dome and you created another t-shirt for Jim Beheim with had 800 because it was 800th win I put in quotation marks because of the whole vacated BS wins which whole other podcast but 
you had made a shirt that said 800 with his face on it. Now at this point, you had graduated. It was right? eight. It was eight. Yeah. Bayheim face. Bayheim face. It was that. So it was the his face, his bald head and round <laughs> face became the zeros, and it was eight zero zero eight Bayheim face. Bayheim face. And I reached out to Michael Rubenstein and one's Manny's. He had the relationship with Julie. He had had a tr very traditional 800 win sell, like, you know, your typical 800 win shirt, collectible memorabilia, nothing high design, just says 800 wins. And he goes, well, I'll let Julie decide. So I had no connection to her. She saw the, the typical normal win jersey and she saw our like clever piece of art and obviously chose our iconic piece of art. And so I got to go up there for the game, hang with the team. It was cool, you know? And I got like, I think a buck a shirt or something. I forget whatever the, the licensing deal I struck with Manny's was. Oh, so the school wasn't giving you a hard time this time. So, right? No, because it was done. A, there was no Syracuse logo on it. I wasn't doing the business. It was officially done with Manny's and the Bayheim. So, wow. So you created two t-shirts. One caused a stir. The other one was done legitimately without a problem. I actually caused, I, I have a third shirt I did with Manny's. Um, was, when we were doing those deep runs years after I graduated, when we looked really good and I was like, man, why weren't they this good when I was there? I did another <laughs> licensing deal with, it said, we zone you. Yeah. And the, and I did, we zone you. Oh, how'd that one sell? I don't know. I mean, we got made a couple thousand bucks there as well. It's hard to like, I had a full-time job. This is just side fun, with a little bit of money. It's hard to like, hey, I'd like to audit your books and see how many shirts you sold. Like, who cares? Well, fast forward now to 2019. So you've been out of school for a while. You decide to come up with three wishes. Can you describe that process of how you got to that point? So basically, when I was 28 years old, I started my own advertising and branding agency called Big Eyed Wish. And I do branding, advertising for other companies and still do. And you help some brands and you, you name them, you do the packaging, and then you watch them become big, huge, multi-million dollar companies. And I kind of said, well, that seems fun. I'd like to build my own brand, but I didn't necessarily have the idea, but I always knew that was a good business. My business is hard to scale if you care about quality. Scaling a creative agency that makes creative product is difficult to scale with quality. And a product like a box of cereal, uh, a mattress, a razor, those things scale. You, you make people really care about something. And when my first son was six months old, my wife came up with the idea and said, what about a cereal? And I went, oh my God, like no one's really reinvented cereal yet. I love that. So we spent two years taking profits from the ad agency, hiring food scientists, doing research, finding labs. It's really, really difficult to make a delicious, healthy, clean ingredient, high protein, low sugar, gluten and grain free cereal. So it took longer than I anticipated. It took more money than I anticipated. And then in October, 2019, we launched. Right before the pandemic. Yes. Much. And yeah. what I, from what I saw, you kind of doubled down on retailers. Well, we didn't really, I mean, there's obviously we spent money and tried to do internet sales, which worked, but the problem is we're trying to run a good business. And the unit economics and margins to acquire a customer on the internet and ship them a box of air basically sucks and you lose money. So we always plan to build our brand through the right retailers, Wegmans, Whole Foods, Sprouts, like there's a iconic, great retailers. And that's, that's where we wanted to build. There's an endless shelf. Anyone could sell anything on the internet. It's a, it's a, it's a limitless shelf, but to be able to get your packaging, your product on the shelf of a reputable retailer at, at with multiple facings at eye level is a big deal. Wegmans has a really nice display. I saw it there when I was there in town a couple of weeks ago. I said, wow, that's, they're, they're putting it out for them right there for sure. So, you know, two years later, now the NIL name, image, and likeness and the, the NCA loosens their laws. You reached out to Buddy Beheim. What'd you say to Buddy? Well, I didn't reach out to Buddy Beheim. I didn't think that was the way to go. I went to Julie. Um, wow. But basically, uh, a lot of the marketing and advertising I've done in my career is timely, buzzy, not fully viral, but very shared, tons of press and media, because I seem to have a knack for understanding what's going to make news, what's going to make a journalist want to write about you. So I knew that the first brand that did a real commercial and a real partnership that mimicked Nike and Jordan, you know, like a real athlete, I knew all these college kids. 
obviously every brand is going to hire them and they're going to sell some crap on their social media. That's the obvious thing, right? Like, oh, now I have a social media channel. I'll grow my social media. I'll tell everyone to drink athletic greens or to go to this, whatever. That's the obvious. I thought it'd be really cool to make like the first real looking 30 second TV commercial and to put them on the box, like a Wheaties box where athletes go on, but now it's a college athlete. And coincidentally, Syracuse is orange, Wheaties box is orange, Wegmans and Syracuse are very close. So it's an, I had like a retailer that's endemic to the area, along with a team player that's endemic to the area, along with a kid that did great in the tournament, who's got a famous dad with high name recognition. So all of it immediately clicked. And I was like, if I get a buddy and do this and be the first and fast, it's gonna be successful. So I hit up Manny's Michael Rubenstein. He gave me Julie's cell phone number. I cold called her, she picked up. I reminded her that I did the 800 win shirt. We had a nice phone call and I, we quickly negotiated a deal. I was up there in two weeks shooting the commercial. We edited it in a couple of days and we released it. And then months later we had the box ready and got into Wegmans and that's what we're doing. Funny that you say that the 800 shirt is the one that helped you get the Buddy Beheim deal because you made that shirt years ago. As you said, I don't know the margins of the profits, but it paid dividends later with Buddy Beheim and, and Julie Beheim. Now, a lot of people talk about these NIL deals as a wild, wild west. It's hard to understand sometimes, you know, what, how it goes into it. You just described how you did it with Julie Beheim. But since you've got Buddy with the logo on it, do you have to negotiate something with the school as well? Or how does that work? Yes. Yes. Originally, we were going to maybe put him in just an orange jersey and not the Syracuse jersey. But we all agreed it's way better with him in uniform. But then he's, if in uniform, then you have to pay the school. So once I did a deal with the collegiate licensing company, then at that point, I had the rights to use Syracuse. So then I used the Syracuse on the side and used the colors and the style guide. So just lean all into the school. Do you have to give him a cut though every time that you sell a box or how does that yes. work? Yes. Yes. You pay a fee for, yes, we pay. Yeah. We negotiated a fee for a certain amount of boxes. Did you already pass that? amount of boxes because they seem like they're selling like crazy uh no we're still within the no. bounds of of the uh of our of our first production run. my son is a toddler he doesn't eat a lot of cereal kind of like what i think you saw when you wanted to build the cereal brand he uh he liked it right away um and for that i thank you <laughs> because it's hard to get him to eat breakfast sometimes so he's he's all about that you know let's talk more about the team now and how, how it is and how things are going you know, at the Louisville game a few weeks ago, you were in Adam Whiteson's box. You and I kind of crossed paths, but we didn't talk there. But uh, Pete Davidson came in in the second half, and you met him. What was that like? I didn't really meet him. It was a two-second thing. I basically, oh. uh, you know, I, I have a mutual friend, my friend Doug Robinson. Uh, he went to Newhouse. He created the show The Goldbergs on ABC. He used to run Adam Sandler's production company called Happy Madison, I believe. And he's become a friend, mentor. I see him when I'm in L.A., and I knew that he was tight with Weitzman. I was driving up with my buddy, Scott. We're throwing it back. My same buddy that I did Don't Tay Leave. I went to high school with Scott. I went to college with Scott. So I brought him. I got the tickets through Julie. I brought Scott up. I shot the commercial with Scott. So anyway, we went up. We were driving up 81 a couple hours early. We planned to go to Fagan's, get a drink, you know, whatever. And I see this huge, ridiculous red or orange Ford Raptor pickup truck. And I'm driving next to it. And I see like, a all diamond i think richard meal watch which is worth like millions and i'm like i think that's weitzman so i honk and he's on the phone and we roll the windows down and i hold up a box of three wishes and like you know he like gives us a thumbs up and then i wake doug up at like 7 30 in the morning california time and i'm like i just passed adam on the highway and then he goes do you know adam's bringing pete davidson i'm like what i'm like oh my god could you think of a a hotter person all of a sudden just because they're dating Kim like he could not be more in the zeitgeist he's as hot as he's ever going to be in his career so I said can you reach out to Adam tell him I'm the guy that you saw on the highway and I'd love to like go hang or whatever and he writes back to Doug and says yeah here's my number tell him to come to my suite so I brought some boxes into the suite and then when they came in at halftime I, I, I was like yo can we take a picture send it to Doug with Adam and then I said Pete can we get a photo and my friend Scott and I photo bomb Pete. He loved the box. He had one. He goes, Hey, these are cool. Can I have a few more? And I'm like, yeah, Shay, take them. And I shared the picture on the internet. And just by virtue of the freaking internet with the hashtag and Pete Davidson and Pete Davidson fan accounts, we wound up getting on the biggest gossip site on Instagram. So what the New York coaches, the, what used to be, you know, uh, Perez Hilton, then it, you know, always is page six in the New York post or TMZ. 
the biggest celebrity gossip site in the world on Instagram is called Demoi, D-E-U-X-M-O-I. And somehow that we got picked up there and someone just had a picture of Pete Davidson because it went viral because Davidson got booed. I didn't, I was sitting right there when everyone booed Davidson. I'm going, what the hell? Why are they booing this guy? And then I heard that he said nasty stuff about Syracuse in 2019. So clearly he was there to do a little reputation management. So how great is it that he got booed? Because if he didn't get booed, I don't even think anyone cares. So because he got booed, people, the press start covering it. Then people are looking for content from what happened there. And then there's an amazing shot of Pete holding up the three wishes boxes. And then this Dumois site basically pictured him. And, he, and you could see he has a couple boxes in his hand. And someone messaged this account and goes, I have to know what is in Pete's hand. And then they reposted like the best advertisement ever, like a full on shot of Pete holding my cereal. And then I got more texts than I've ever gotten in my life because like that blew up. So sometimes it's right place, right time and enough of entrepreneurial hustle. You didn't know him beforehand or anything. It was just coincidence that you passed Adam Weitzman at that moment and you honked yes. the horn. Yes. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing that that went down like that. And that's awesome in the same point. You know, it's, it's good to show that you, you can just get a deal just by driving. I'm it's not just by driving. It really comes down to my 0% fear of rejection. I have no, I have no fear of rejection. I've been rejected so many times that I don't even think about it. It's like, I wish I had my mentality as an athlete. So I play golf and I don't have the same mentality. Hit a bad shot and I think about it. And on the next shot, when all the good golfers know that your next shot is ahead of you and you forget about the shot before. But I have like entrepreneurship connecting and convincing people is my sport. And I will go up to anyone. I don't care. And if they blow me off or whatever, I just think they're, you know, they're a loss, not mine. And so that's kind of been my attitude since I was born. Talk about the team now, they're struggling, you know, um, 13 and 12, it's been kind of a tough year. I know you've done a lot of deals. I know you've been uh, in and out of with your business and I'm sure you had a lot of things go on facing adversity. What would you tell the team right now that's kind of facing adversity trying to make any postseason tournament if Jim Baham called you? Oh, I have, I'd say, don't listen to me, listen to coach. I am the last, I am not here. I'm in no business giving any sort of advice other than I love you guys, believe in yourself, shoot, don't give up, put in the extra effort, just like anything else, just like, just work, work until you're dead and collapse. That's the only thing they can do is just try until they die and collapse. Because you can know that, you know, there's different, you watch the NBA, you know, the difference between a regular season game and you see the postseason intensity. So now for them, every game is the postseason. So they better just work until they collapse. And that's really it. What's it like when you're watching the game? either in person or at home? Are you like completely glued in? Are you thinking about the deals that you can maybe make off of this or? No, it's interesting. It's just, no, I mean, obviously I want the team to do well because I love the team and I, I go crazy for the team. That's my favorite sports team. Like nothing would make me happier than a Syracuse national championship. I don't care about the Jets or the Yankees or the Rangers or anyone as much as this. I, I care, yeah, I mean like Tiger Woods, some big fat tennis guys and Syracuse basketball is like my thing. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's tough, but I mean, it's tougher on them. <laughs> like I got a wife, I got kids, I got a dog, I have businesses. So I, I can't, I, I care, but like when they lose, I'm bummed, but I can go to sleep. I'm sure they're like not sleeping the same way. So it's very different and harder for them. What do you think is going to happen first? Syracuse going to the final four, or you're going to have another flavor of three wishes? Definitely another flavor for three wishes. <laughs> you got one in, in process right now? Yeah, exactly. So that one I could guarantee the other one looks like, I mean, it would be the miracle on uh, University Avenue. <laughs> it's funny because I've asked that question a few times, a few people, and they all already have something in the hopper when I've already talked to them. So I should probably know that by now, but I don't. Um, any other players on the team feel kind of jealous that Buddy got the first deal? Like, did Jimmy say like, hey, what about me, the gym? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't ask. I, I think it's a very weird, sticky situation, but you know, don't know yeah. what to tell you. That's what <laughs> I did. And I can't, uh, I can't worry about that. No Joe, no Joe's uh, logo Joe's or, um, any other guys in, in the mix maybe for another cereal? No, it's buddy. <laughs> it's buddy. And that's it. Ian, thanks for coming on. I know you mentioned where we can find the products. I got mine in the destiny USA. And again, I'm not just saying this because you're on my podcast, but last night my son after dinner asked for three wishes. And I said, you mean you want to have three wishes? You want the cereal? I said, I want the cereal. 
I said, all right. That's awesome. That was Ian Wishingrad on the Dome Dot podcast. That was a lot of fun to hear how he came up with his t-shirt ideas. Then later on, how he cold called Julie Beheim to get the three wishes deal done. Then how he was driving on the highway past Adam Weitzman. He just held up his box. And voila, later on in the day, he's in the box with Pete Davidson and Adam Weitzman. Talked about being an entrepreneur. And he's been that way his whole life. So for Syracuse, next is Boston College. Should be a win. Last time Edwards fought out of the game. Now he's out for the season. It's Frank Aslam in the middle. Look for him to get more touches as Syracuse tries to build his confidence for this tough run. Three games in five days, five games in 10 days. And Ian said in the podcast, it's really every game is almost like a postseason game. They can't lose too many more. Otherwise, it's not going to be postseason at all, whether it's NIT or NCA. That's all I got on the Dome Dog podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. It seems to me that I keep having guests and they keep mentioning almost the next guest. So hopefully I can maybe get Dante Green to come on and talk about his experience at Syracuse that one year, his t-shirt and what happened exactly. But we'll see. Dome Dog podcast is brought to you by Zalstone Jewelry. Live luxury lifestyle. Anyone who orders now until the end of February will receive 20% off the website price. Just mention Dome Dog podcast in the shipping instructions. That's zalstone.com. Z-A-L. S T O N E. Thanks for listening to the Dome Dog Podcast. Now available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Google, Audible, and more. Check out the YouTube page and please join the Facebook group. It's facebook.com slash groups slash Dome Dog Pod. That's D O M E D A W G P O D.